So first of all, I would like to thank you for the introduction. And of course, I would also like to thank Angela, Monica and Miles for the kind invitation. And finally, I have to apologize to everybody, but my talk will be much more technical than, the, for example, the talk of Henri Bresticky. Uh, this is due to the fact that, in fact, in particular in the second half of the talk, I want to give you the sketch of the proof of the main Lewis theorem. And so perhaps there is no way to avoid the technicalities. Okay, so in my talk, I will be interested in uh, Liouville theorems for scaling invariant superlinear parabolic problems, saying that the problem does not possess positive classical solutions defined for all times running from minus infinity to infinity. And the motivation for the study is that uh, such Liouville theorems combined with scaling and doubling arguments uh, guarantee optimal universal estimates of solutions of more general problems, even in more general space-time domains. I mean, this uh, you can see, for example, in the paper, uh, with, in my joint paper with Peter Polacic and Philip Souple in 2007. And in fact, in uh, my talk, I will sketch the proof of an optimal Liouville theorem for a model problem only for the semilinear heat equation, u sub t minus Laplace of u equals u to the power of p, which is sometimes also called Fujita equation. But our approach can also be used for several superlinear parabolic systems and also for the linear heat equation with a nonlinear boundary condition, for example. And uh, this can be found, for example, in my preprints, which are available on archive. Uh, the first one uh, will appear in the Duke Mathematical Journal. So in fact, uh, today I will only speak about this model problem, the semilinear heat equation, and by a solution, I will always mean uh, classical positive solutions, which is defined for all x. And in this introduction, I will consider several classes of solutions. The largest one is just this script L. These are all solutions uh, which are just defined locally in time, say on a time interval, capital T1, capital T2. Then there are global and Einstein solutions, which are defined for all positive times and for all negative times, respectively. Well, for me, the most interesting class will be the class of entire or eternal solutions, E, which is defined for all T from minus infinity to infinity. And uh, of course, we will also consider stationary solutions. This is the class S and forward and backward self-similar solutions, which are just solutions of this particular form. And please uh, notice that here there is this exponent beta equals to one over p minus one, and this exponent will appear frequently in my talk. And the question which I'm interested in is whether this set of uh, entire solution is empty or under which assumptions and on p, can one say that this, this set is empty because uh, then in fact, uh, we can, I mean, such a result has many, many, many consequences as we will see. So let me first say a few words about the history of this problem. So probably the first result in this direction was proved by Fujita and then by Hayakawa and Sugitani, say 50 years ago. And they proved in fact that a set of all global solutions, this large one, is empty if and only if the exponent, the exponent P is less than or equal than N plus two over N, which is just the Fujita exponent. And then slightly later in 1981, Gidas and Sprach showed that the set of stationary solutions is empty if and only if the exponent P is less than the critical Sobel exponent, which is just this n plus two over n minus two. And in fact, this result was already, was already known that time, uh, but only for radial solutions. In the radial case, uh, such a result was proved already 50 years earlier by Fowler and some related results for radial solutions for n equal to three were obtained even earlier by Emden and Lane. And so since you see that the set of entire solutions uh, somehow contains S and is contained in G, then it's natural of course to expect that if there is a critical exponent for the emptiness of the set E, then it should be something between this critical Sobel exponent and this Fujita exponent. And in fact, in 1998, Marie-Francoise Bidoveron proved, uh, say, the first intrinsic Liouville theorem for these entire solutions, 
And she was able to adapt the arguments of Gidas and Sprague to the parabolic case. And she proved that the set E is empty whenever this exponent P is less than N times N plus two over N minus one square. Of course, if N equals to one, so this is infinity, so it's okay. But if N is bigger than two, bigger than one, greater than one, then this exponent is less than the subordinate exponent. And Marie France was conjectured, in fact, that the correct exponent here should be the critical subordinate exponent, similarly as in the as for stationary solutions. And she wrote that, uh, well, we hope to extend the result up to P or than PS. And this conjecture was then uh, somehow supported by two more results. Uh, in 1998, Mel, uh, Frank Merle and Hatem Zaf proved a very nice Liouville theorem for ancient solutions. And uh, this theorem, in fact, uh, guaranteed that the set of entire positive entire solutions with a self similar decay as t goes to minus infinity is empty in the full subcritical range where p is less than the critical sub of exponent. And similarly, later with Peter Polacic and Philip Souple, we proved that the set of positive entire solutions, which are radially symmetric, is empty in the full subcritical range. But unfortunately, I mean, the proof of the fact that this set is empty uh, in the full subcritical range was still missing. Uh, the last result, which I would like to mention, is, is my result from 2016. In fact, I proved that the set of positive entire solutions is empty provided P is less than the Serin's exponent, N over N minus two. Now you can see that if N equals one or two, then this is optimal because you don't have any condition on P. But if N is greater than two, then this Serin exponent is even less than the exponent of Guido Veron. Therefore, this result brought something new only if uh, N is equal to one, if, if N is equal to two, in fact. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, uh, the arguments used in this paper were completely different from the arguments above. In fact, uh, the proof was based on uh, the use of similarity variables and uh, energy estimates and then scaling argument, which uh, was used for the first time probably by uh, Giga and Kohn in 1980s in the study of law rate. And it turns out that these arguments can also be used in order to prove an optimal result, which is now formulated as theorem one here, yeah. that really, in fact, the set of positive entire solutions of this Fujita equation is empty if and only if P is subordinate subcritical. Of course, the difference between the proof of, of this, let's say, optimal result and, and this, this partial result consists in refining some energy estimates, as we will see. So before I give you the sketch of the proof, let me just mention few possible con uh, coral well, application of this theorem. In fact, uh, if one combines, I mean, this theorem for a P subcritical uh, with scaling and doubling arguments, then one can see that in fact, many properties of all local positive solutions of this problem in this large set are determined by the corresponding properties of self-similar solutions, forward and backward self-similar solutions. In particular, if one studies the blow up rates of local solutions uh, defined in an interval T1, T2, then one gets this universal estimate for all these solutions in the set L. And here these estimates are optimal, as it is known. In fact, uh, and they coincide, of course, with the, with the initial and final blow up rate, uh, rates of forward and backward self similar solutions. In addition, I mean, such estimates can be proved also in a more general situation. Just for simplicity, let us consider still the Fujita equation, but in a domain omega cross uh, T1, T2, and uh, assume that the solution satisfy homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions. And then we obtain again, it's very similar estimate. And uh, we just, the only thing we have to know about this omega, uh, it has to be a smooth domain. It can be unbounded, it can be bounded, it can be well, non-convex, it's not important. And in fact, I mean, this blow up rate estimate, this final blow up rate estimate uh, for solutions defined in a domain satisfying homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions was uh, proved uh, 
already by Giga and Con in 1987, but only for convex domains. And, in, uh, and then it remained open for more than 30 years, whether or not the result stays true also for non-convex domain, and this is the answer, in fact. Similarly, as in the case of blow up, of course, we also have decay estimates, which are again optimal. For any global or ancient solution, we have the, the following estimate. So uh, we have an estimate uh, by the decay of the self similar solution. So of self similar solution. And if one combines, I mean, this inequality with the Liouville theorem for ancient solutions by Merlin Zach then the corollary is that any ancient solution in the subcritical case, of course, has to be specially homogeneous. And uh, it should be also mentioned that, uh, of course, these estimates here in general fail if P is greater than or equal than PS. This is well known. I do not have time to discuss, of course, these interesting results, but let me mention only, only one uh, result in the supercritical case, which is maybe interesting from the point of view of Liouville theorems. And this is the, uh, the following result. So if we assume that n is greater than or equal than 3, and uh, we denote by p l, so-called Lepin's exponent, 1 plus 6 over n minus 10, positive part, which is in this space dimension always greater than the Sobolev critical exponent. And also if I denote by eb or ebr, the set of all positive entire solutions which are bounded or bounded and radially symmetric, respectively. Then we have the following facts. First of all, if P is critical or supercritical in the sub -left sense, then there exists a bounded positive entire solution, which is not stationary. In addition, if we also know that P is less than the slapping exponent, then there even exists a bounded radially symmetric positive entire solution, which is not stationary. This was shown by Fila and Yanagida in 2011. On the other hand, together with Peter Polacek, we recently proved that, if, that this condition on PL, in fact, is not just technical, because if P is greater than PL, then uh, the whole set of positive entire bounded readily symmetric solutions is contained in the set of stationary solutions. In other words, if you take any bounded radial symmetric positive entire solution, then it has to be time independent. So this is a kind of a Liouville theorem here. And please notice that this Liouville theorem is true for these radial solutions, but it is not true for non-radial solutions. It follows from uh, the result of Filariana Gida, which is just the third result. So there is a striking difference between the radial and non-radial case concerning the Liouville theorem. Okay. So in, in the rest of my talk, in fact, I will try to give you the sketch of the proof of theorem one, saying that for P less than the critical Sobolev exponent, there are no positive entire solutions. So uh, assume on the contrary, that P is subcritical and that there exists a solution U, which is positive and entire. Then using scaling and doubling arguments, it is easy to see that uh, we can find another positive entire solution, which is bounded, in fact, and bounded by one. And therefore, without loss of generality, we can assume that this solution U is bounded by one. And then we denote by uh, rho y, I mean the Gaussian weight, and also for any a in Rn and any integer k, which runs from one, two, and so on, and the time t less than k, we introduce I mean, these are the scaled functions W, which depend on A and K. And these are just the standard uh, rescaled functions which you obtain if you use the similarity variables. I mean, this is quite classical, so I'm not going to explain this in detail. In any case, such rescaled functions uh, solve, I mean, the, this equation, the time derivative of W now is one over rho, is the Gaussian weight the gradient of rho times gradient w minus beta w plus w to the power p in the whole space, I mean, rn cross r. And if you multiply, I mean, this equation w by, by this weight rho and integrate and use a simple blow up argument, then uh, you obtain 
I mean, this is easy estimate for the integrals of W rho and W to the power of B rho, where this constant C depends only on the dimension and P. This is so-called Kaplan estimate. It was uh, used or proved uh, for the first time probably almost 60 years ago by, by Kaplan. And in fact, also in the rest of my talk, I will, by C, I will denote different constants, positive constants, which will always depend only on N and P. So in particular, they will be independent of, of this A and K. And that, uh, well, of course, one advantage of this equation that we obtain is this Kaplan estimates, but uh, maybe even a more important advantage of this equation that we have a Lyapunov functional for this problem, which denote by E as I call it energy for some reasons. So we have uh, this function ES, which is defined in this way. And using the equation W, you can uh, write it also in a slightly different form here. And uh, since we assume that U is bounded, the parabolic regularity tells us that the gradient of U is also bounded. And therefore, I mean, these integrals are well defined. And also one can easily show that the derivative of this function with respect to S has a sign. And more precisely, the derivative equals minus the integral over Rn of the time derivative of S squared times rho. In addition, a blow up argument shows that uh, this function E stays non-negative. And finally, the last estimate which I will need for, for this uh, energy function E, if I take sk equal to minus logarithm of k. Just notice that this corresponds to the time t equal to zero. Yeah. So all this sk would correspond to time t equal to zero. And if I consider s greater than or equal than this time sk minus some constant, then the definition of w a k gives me that the function w is bounded by constant time k to the power of beta. And if I combine I'm this estimate with the Kaplan estimates, and with the monotonicity of E, then one can easily get, I mean, uh, this estimate for, for the energy, that the E uh, at this S, this time S, is less than or equal, again, uh, than some constant C times K to the power of beta. Uh, this C is, is different from this one, of course. So let me now recall the main result on, on this slide, in the second slide. So we have these rescaled functions W, for each a and for each k. And we know that w solves this equation. It's the same as the equation in the previous slide, but it's just the, written in a slightly different form. And then the energy function satisfies this identity. It's non negative and it's bounded by c times k to the power of beta. And now the crucial point is now to use the scaling argument of giga and con. So how does this argument work? So I assume for a while that we are able to show the following estimate, that the, this energy function E uh, for A equal to zero and K at uh, time SK minus one can be bounded by C times K to the power of gamma, where gamma is less than this strange exponent mu, which is P plus one over P minus one minus and a half. In fact, this exponent mu is positive if P is subcritical. And uh, let's choose lambda k to be one over squared of k. And let us rescale this function w k again, just by standard parabolic scaling here. And notice that since w k satisfy or solve this equation, then this new functions b k, in fact, will also solve this equation but these blue terms will be multiplied by lambda k squared and lambda k tends to zero as, as k tends to zero. Therefore, in the limit, since we are able to pass the limit with the subsequence of these scaled solutions, we obtain then the, the, the limit v, in fact, solves the original Fujita equation, of course, in a, and it's in fact an ancient solution of the Fujita equation. Well, in addition, if one computes this integral, where here there is a time derivative of vk squared, then just by substitution, we obtain that this equals to k to the power of minus mu 
times the corresponding integral for the function w, um, time derivative of w squared. And uh, this energy identity here, of course, implies that this integral can be bounded by the energy. And we assume that energy is less than or equal than c times k to the power of gamma. Therefore, the whole thing here, since gamma is less than mu, tends to zero as k goes to infinity. And therefore, this ancient solution here, in fact, is so independent. And therefore, it's a stationary solution, positive stationary solutions of the Fujita equation. But since we work with p subcritical, the result of Gida's practice tells us that the, this set is empty, which yields a contradiction. Therefore, of course, uh, such function u, uh, as we assumed in the very beginning, cannot exist. And therefore, the set E has to be empty. Of course, now we have this estimate here, and we need the estimate with k to the power of beta, and we need this estimate with k to the power of gamma, where gamma is less than this mu. And so it's immediate that if this beta is less than mu, then I can use this estimate here, and I'm done. I have proved the Liouville theorem. But unfortunately, I mean, this inequality, beta less than mu, is equivalent to p less than n over n minus 2. So this is, uh, I mean, much more severe condition than just p less than ps. And this has already been done. Everything what I uh, said so far was done in my paper in 2016. So now I would like to show you that, in fact, uh, I can, one can use this giga clone argument also, if beta is greater than or equal than mu. And the reason for that is, in fact, that we will see that in, in this case, one can refine this estimate. And instead of this estimate, one can obtain estimate of this form. And then it's sufficient to use just, the, just these arguments. So let me show how one can improve or refine this energy argument here, energy estimate here. So the, the idea is the following. So we, we assume that beta is greater than or equal to mu. And we know this estimate, which we already proved here. But we need the estimate with k to the power gamma, where gamma is less than mu, and mu is less than or equal to beta. So what we will show, in fact, is that if we take any gamma in this interval, mu beta, and the s in, in this interval of this form, then if I assume that the energy function is bounded by c times k to the power of gamma for all a and for k large, then at the time s plus 1, we obtain better estimate for the energy with a c times k to the power of gamma tilde, where gamma tilde is less than gamma. So uh, if we replace time s with s plus 1, we can decrease the exponent in this estimate. And of course, uh, how to obtain, I mean, uh, this estimate here. We start with the known estimate, I mean, this one, at time sk minus m, where m is an integer, which depends only on n and p. And then we use this argument m minus 1 times. And after this m minus 1 steps, we uh, uh, obtain uh, the desired estimate, this gamma less than mu. We just m minus 1 times decrease the exponent until we reach, I mean, the desired exponent here. And this really can be done. So, so in fact, in the again, in the rest of the proof, I will show you how to prove this uh, assertion B. B stands for bootstrap. So we want to prove this, this uh, bootstrap assertion. So the first uh, thing which one can use is this, of course, this assumption that the energy is bounded by C times K to the power of gamma. And uh, the energy identity tells me that, in fact, this integral of the time derivative of w squared times rho is bounded by, by the same quantity here. And since, since this integral over the unit time interval is bounded by something, therefore also the integrand, I mean, this inner integral, has to be bounded by the larger quantity for most of s star in this interval s s plus 1. Because otherwise, of course, uh, if I had opposite inequality for, more, for many S stars, so I could integrate this and I would obtain opposite inequality here. Therefore, in fact, uh, I have free, freedom now uh, here because I have many S star for which, I mean, this is true. And now if I can find at least one S star such 
that this is true. And if I also can prove that this integral of W to the power of P plus one is bounded by C times K to the power gamma tilde, with gamma tilde less than gamma, I denote this by double star, then in fact, I'm done with this inequality because uh, I mean this energy at time S plus one due to the monotonicity of the energy can be bounded by the energy at time S star. Now, this is just the, the expression for, for, for the energy. And the first integral here can be easily estimated by the Cauchy inequality. The first, I mean term, the first integral here can be bounded by, by this uh, inequality star here. And the second integral can be uh, estimated by, by Helder's inequality. And then by this assumption double star, the second integral again can be estimated by this uh, assumption double star. And what we end uh, with is just the, that E at time S plus one is less than or equal than C times K to the power of gamma hat, where gamma hat is less than gamma. So this is precisely what we have to show. And therefore, instead of showing, I mean, this inequality, it is sufficient to prove, I mean, this inequality double star. So in what follows, instead of proving, I mean, this uh, as assertion B, I will prove this assertion B prime, where the right-hand side here, this inequality is replaced by this inequality double star. Okay, so I just have to show that if the energy at time S is less than or equal than C times K to the power gamma, then for suitable S star in the interval S, S plus one, I mean, this integral of W to the power P plus one is uh, estimated by something which is better than this one. And uh, so I would still want to somehow <laughs> replace this B star with something different, with some B double, B, B prime, some B double prime. So let me continue. Uh, I denote by capital RK, I mean just this square root of 8n times logarithm of k, and then using uh, this estimate for w, which follows from the definition of w, and since this rho is just the Gaussian weight function, then it is very easy to, to see that the, in, the corresponding integral here, but just over the complement of the ball with radius RK, can be estimated by constant. Because here we have somehow polynomial grows in k, and this grows somehow with an exponential speed. And therefore, since th this integral is bounded, uh, it's sufficient to prove that the integral over the ball with radius rk of w to the power p plus 1 is bounded. Instead of the, the whole integral over the whole of Rn, it's sufficient to work with this ball with radius rk. And next, I still not very happy with such large balls. I would like to work with uh, unit balls. So what I do, for any A, I will find uh, finitely many uh, centers A1, A2, up to A capital K, uh, capital X, with the number X being proportional to logarithm K to the power N half, such the ball with radius RK can be covered by unit balls bi, where bi which is just a unit ball with center lowercase bi. And see, well, you can see that this bi depend on this s star, but in fact, this choice of a i can be made independent of this s star. It's not so difficult to see. And now assume that we can prove that the integrals over a unit ball of functions w to the power p plus one is estimated by c times k to the power of gamma tilde, where this w equals w a i k and a i i just these a i's. And if we can show this, then I mean I have to estimate this integral and this integral over the large ball b r k, since the large ball is covered by by these unit balls, uh, this can be estimated by the sum of the integrals of the unit balls, and then using I mean, this property, uh, I mean, this is the definition of WAK and WAIK, I see that this is true. And therefore these integrals in fact are equal to the integrals of the unit ball of these functions WAIK. And since I assume that these integrals are bounded in this way, so I can estimate the sum by C times K to the power of gamma tilde plus epsilon. This epsilon comes from the fact that 
here the number x is a logarithm, something like logarithm of k to the power n half, and this can be bounded by k to the power of epsilon. But still, if uh, gamma tilde is less than gamma, then this gamma tilde plus small epsilon will be still less than gamma. So in fact, I obtained the estimate which I wanted to have here. I wanted to have this estimate, and uh, this is true if I can show these estimates for all the functions w, a, i, k. And uh, now, in addition, I mean my assumption that E s is less than or equal than c times k to the power gamma, the energy identity implies that this integral of the square of the time derivative of w squared is less than or equal than c times k to the power gamma for all w of this form. And therefore, in, in this b prime assertion, I can replace the left hand side uh, by, by this inequality because I mean, this thing implies this one. And here, the right hand side can be uh, replaced by these inequalities for all W, A, I, K, because uh, this inequality implies this one. And therefore, what I have to show is, I mean, this assertion B double prime. On the next slide, I will rewrite the game. So we want to prove, I mean, this estimate. And in fact, now, uh, one can easily prove, in fact, the following lemma. I will explain in more detail how can, this can be proved. That if I'm given some parameters xi, zeta, and alpha, which satisfy these uh, inequalities, and if dk and rk squared are greater than or equal than k to the power minus alpha, w is just w of a i k, and b is any point in Rn, then this integral estimate of the time derivative of w squared uh, with right hand side k to the power zeta uh, implies a pointwise bound of these functions for at time s, s star with, with this power k to the power psi for all k large enough. And I claim that in fact this lemma can be shown again by using the same Giacon argument as I used already just one has to combine it with a doubling argument. So how one can prove this? Assume for a while that this estimate is not true, then we can find the point where this is violated. And at this point, of course, one can rescale W as it was done in the gigacon scaling argument. And then if one can proceed, I mean, if you can think, pass to the limit with, with the rescaled function, say vk, then again one obtains an ancient solution. And then this integral estimate tells me that the ancient solution is, is in fact a stationary solution, which contradicts the result v doesn't sprung. So it's precisely the same argument as, as in the Gigacon scaling argument. But the problem here is how to pass to the limit with this rescaled function vk, because in order to do this, you have to know a good uh, estimate on this function w uh, and a suitable, suitably large parabolic neighborhood of the point where you is k. And this is not available in fact, but uh, now you can use this doubling argument. So if, if uh, this inequality is violated and the, the necessary estimates in the parabolic neighborhood of this point are not satisfied, then you choose a different point, a different point and so on. And after finally many steps using the doubling argument, you obtain a point where again, this is violated, but you have the, the necessary estimate or on, on the function W. So you can really do the same argument. Once you have, I mean, this lemma at, at your hand. So in fact, say if the space dimension N is less than or equal than six, then it is very easy to conclude because you see that in fact, the, this assertion here is very close to what you want to show. You just uh, would like to use, of course, this lemma, this RK equal to one, you have this B2 and B1 here. And then uh, if you also use the Kaplan type estimates, so you can have hope to, to I mean, uh, to show that these pointwise estimates together with the Kaplan type estimates could guarantee, I mean, these estimates which you want to show. Well, unfortunately, as I told you, I mean, the, the simple argument, I mean, it requires the dimension n to be less than or equal than six. And since we want to prove, of course, the 
the theorem for any n, so we have to use a more subtle argument. And this goes as follows. So we will, in fact, uh, use these arguments really with some uh, dk and rk squared equal to k to the power minus alpha. So assume that we are given, say, parameters xi, alpha, and omega satisfying these two inequalities. And our assumption here in B double prime is just this one, this integral is bounded by C times K to the power gamma. Again, this is an integral over a unit interval. Therefore, if I integrate just over the interval of length DK, then this integral will for, for say most of S star will be less than or equal than C times K to the power gamma minus alpha plus epsilon because it's DK equals K to the power minus alpha. So, I mean, you obtain this estimate, say, for most of a star. And now, since I want to work with small rk, so I will cover with this unit ball where I want to get my estimate with uh, finitely many balls of radius rk in such a way that the maximal uh, number of, 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 of the small balls, which have non-empty intersections, can be bounded by a constant C, which depends only on, on the dimension n. So this is just, yeah. So you, you take some uh, suitable covering of, of uh, this ball, unit ball, these small balls. And I will define y sub g, the centers b in y, such that, I mean, this integral which appears in lemma one is less than or equal than c times k to the power gamma minus alpha plus epsilon minus omega. I will call these balls good balls because I have a good estimate here. And I will also define so set capital G, which is just a union of good balls intersected with D1. And now, since in fact, this assumption, I mean, these blue inequalities, which I assume, precisely guarantee that you can use lemma one here. So you obtain for on each of, of these small balls, you obtain this estimate. Therefore, you have this estimate on the whole set capital G, this k to the power of xi. In addition, you can also estimate the, the number of bad balls, which are balls which are not good. So in fact, uh, on each bad ball, you have this opposite inequality. So therefore, if you take the number of, of bad balls and multiply with, with this, this expression here, so it should be less than c times, I mean, I mean, this expression here. And therefore, you obtain that the number of bad balls, in, in fact, is less than or equal than c times k to the power omega. And since the complement of the set g in B1 is covered by the bad balls, so you immediately see that the measure of this set can be bounded by c times k to the power omega, which is just the number of, of these balls, and then times the measure of one of these balls. So this estimate, so these two estimates can be obtained for this set g. And in fact, I will just summarize, I mean, what we just proved in lemma two. So here we prove that if these inequalities for these parameters alpha, omega, and psi are satisfied, then we can always find the set capital G, a subset of B of the unit ball, such that W is bounded by this power of K on G and the complement of the set G uh, can be estimated, the measure of this complement can be estimated by this expression here. So on the next slide, I will just re, uh, recall I'm this lemma two because it's the only thing which I need in order to prove this V double prime. So uh, let me just recall that we want to prove I'm in this assertion here. And we have shown this lemma two, that if these two inequalities are true, then we, I can find set G with these two properties. And then next claim is a little bit technical, but it has nothing to do with PDs. It's just a claim about the solvability of a set of inequalities. So I claim that uh, under our assumptions there always exists gamma tilde less than gamma, an integer capital L, which depends only on N and T, and triplets xi L, alpha L, omega L, such that the sequence xi L is non-decreasing. Uh, uh, in addition, it's estimated above by beta, which I denote by xi sub capital L, and also the first, the smallest psi one is less than this gamma tilde. In addition, any of these triplets for any uh, script L 
satisfies, I mean, these two inequalities, these blue inequalities star. So this is true for any psi L alpha L omega L. And finally, I mean, this exponent in the estimate of, of the complement of G uh, is estimated above by gamma tilde minus P plus one times psi over L, psi L plus one for any L. And once, of course, you, well, the, the proof of this technical claim, in fact, is not so complicated. I mean, in one of the papers, which I mentioned in the very beginning, it takes just 10 lines probably to, to, to prove it. And uh, you immediately see probably that you can use now lemma two with all these triplets. And what you obtain is the following corollary that for any L, from one to L minus one, you, you obtain the set GL such that W is estimated by C times K to the power of Xi, this one. And the measure of the complement of G is estimated, well, by this expression, but since you have this inequality, you can replace, I mean, this exponent with this exponent, so it's done here. And here I wrote that the, this first inequality is also true for script L equals to the capital L, if script L equals to capital L, so I just define G sub L equal to the unit ball, and here uh, Xi sub L equals beta, therefore this inequality for a script L equal to capital L just follows from the definition of W. And on my, uh, the final slide, in fact, in, of the proof, we'll just use, I mean, this corollary in order to show, I mean, uh, this inequality here. So let me try to do this. So we need to show that this uh, integral over the unit ball of W to the power P plus one is estimated in this way. And we have this corollary from the previous slide. And then what we do, we decompose the unit ball into the sets of the form GL plus one minus GL. And the last one is just G one. And uh, the corresponding part of this integral, the integral over G one of W P plus one is estimated in such a way that you take one W and use this estimate here. So you obtain C times K to the power X I one and the rest, this integral of W to the power P can be estimated by Kaplan estimates by C times K to the power epsilon. And since this Xi one was less than gamma tilde, you can choose epsilon small enough so that the sum of these two exponents will be less than gamma tilde and you obtain that this part, the integral of G1 <coughs> is estimated in such a way uh, that, uh, that you need here. And for this, uh, for the differences of these two sets, if you take difference GL plus one minus GL and integrate this function, then this can be again estimated. I mean, this integral is estimated by, by this first property by C times K to the power of P plus one times this psi L plus one, because you, you work in the set G L plus one. And then you just, so you in fact estimate it, I mean this integrand by the maximal value. And then you have to add here the measure of the set where you integrate, but this set is a subset of B one minus G L. So the measure of this set is less than or equal than measure of this set. And for this, you have a good estimate of this column. So you can see probably that if you, at, I mean, this exponent and this exponent, yeah, then you obtain precisely k to the power gamma tilde. And therefore, if you simply add all these inequalities, you obtain the desired inequality here. And this, in fact, concludes the proof because we just proved, I mean, the bootstrap condition V double prime. So here I would like to thank you for attention and apologize again for the old technicalities. <laughs>